Factor Show. The bandwidth for this episode of The Power Factor Show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hey everybody, um, we are going to be doing another episode with Chris Hodgson uh, like we've done in the past um, to basically get your questions uh, and anything that you have on your mind answered. So if you have anything, um, load questions, questions about powder, uh, questions about the industry, questions about Hodgson, stuff like that, uh, go ahead and get the question into us and we will forward it on to Chris and have him uh, hopefully answer it during um, the upcoming episode. So as usual, go ahead and send your questions or anything that's on your mind uh, to powerfactorshow at gmail.com, and we will get this uh, episode done probably here in the next few weeks or so. Thanks. Hey, everybody. This is Steve. Um, one of our viewers asked us to put together a, um, a, a kind of as a show us your bench or show us your reloading bench series here. Uh, so I thought I'd kick it off and do my reloading bench. Um, if you go back and and see what I was using before for a bench, uh, the episode that I did on shot shell reloading on my mech size master, uh, go back and look at that, and you can see how confined my reloading bench was. It was really small. And one of the things I've always wanted to have is a, a, a decent reloading bench or just a workbench for doing stuff. Um, so I kind of took the opportunity to, to go ahead and, and have a bench built um, for just reloading and, and everything here. Um, and I'm really happy that I have because it gives me a whole lot of room now to clean my shotguns or clean my guns or do my reloading or come out here and do work or whatever the case is um, on my bench. It's kind of like my, my little mini man cave, so to speak. <laughs> Um, so the bench plan that I use for this um, comes from, actually is published in um, Shotgun Sports Magazine, and we'll provide a link for you for the actual plans, but um, the plans have actually been around for quite some time. Uh, in fact, it's, it's kind of funny here. So the plans are courtesy of the National Reloading Bench Manufacturers Association. Actually, I wonder if there actually is a manufacturing re or National Reloading Manufacturers Association. It sort of sounds like, you know, the National Association of Spare Tire Manufacturers or something like that. It's like, really? There's actually something like this? But at any rate. Um, so the, I, my, my plan was to build this bench with my father-in-law. Um, and unfortunately, he was bored and had more time than I had and got working on it and got it together pretty much uh, in about the period of a week or so, give or take. Um, so I really never got a chance to actually work on the bench, um, which was okay by me. It's, I mean, it's nice to, to get a bench, but it would have actually you know, been kind of fun to go through the process because I'm not exactly a woodworking guy, so I probably would have learned some things um, in the process of making it. But So... Uh, the bench, uh, in terms of construction, is pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Um, it uses pretty pretty heavy wood. Uh, it uses carriage bolts uh, for a lot of the attachments and wood screws for everything else. Um, it's interesting that the plans here say, and this is kind of funny, that is currently designed. The work area is about waist high for a person six foot two. Okay, well I'm six foot one. And my concern with the height of this bench with the Dillon SL900 was really the height of the shell hopper here because I realized that if this thing got much higher that I would have a hard time getting holes in here and also a 25 pound bag of shot into the shot hopper here. So I really seriously considered at this point, it's like, you know, yeah, I could build it that high, but I might not be able to get stuff into the hopper here unless I get myself a stool or something to get on top of. All right, probably not that ridiculous, but it is a bit of a stretch. Um, so they mentioned about being waist high for a person six foot two. 
I'm six foot one. I decided to basically take a few inches off the height of the bench. So my waist is here. The top of the deck is there. Um, they say the legs in this thing are, I think, 42 inches by design. I think I had the legs cut to about 39 inches or so, maybe 38. But I wanted to get the bench at a, a decent height here. The other thing I didn't know on terms of my SL900, since I didn't have it at the time, is that if, whether I would stand and reload or whether I would sit and reload. So I went out and bought a stool just in case I might want to sit and reload, but I found that for me that when I do reloading in the SL900, it's easier and, and just more comfortable for me to stand and do reloading. The other thing is the press is so fast that I'm not, I'm not out here for a very long period. I'm not standing on my feet all day long or anything like that. I mean, in an hour, I can crank out more than enough ammunition on this thing. Um, so some of the other modifications done to this are the, the back shelf area here. And the, the plans here, which you'll see, have cabinet doors and stuff like that. Um, and I didn't want to go to that fancy level of design here. So what my father-in-law did is basically just made these multi-level shelves um, that you can move the positions of these things around and pull them in, take them out, stuff like that, kind of change the shelving arrangement, which worked out really well for me. Um, a couple other modifications here, real small, is that he put these little wing extenders here on the end so that, and it's like, you know, this is going to happen. You have like a ball or a ball bearing or something, you know, rolling along the surface and bling, right over the edge. So this kind of keeps things contained here from, from rolling off. It can roll off for the front, but it can't roll off to the side. If it rolls off to the front, it's easy. It's right here in front of me. Um, it's not a problem. Um, one of the other things I did is that this mat I got from Walmart, which is actually pretty nice, it's a about a 3 8 inch thick rubber thickness mat that seems to be impervious to um, chemicals or anything like that. I think it's a, a, a sink mat or a dish mat or something like that. Um, or maybe it's a mat designed to stand on, I don't know, but you can find them in their kitchen section. Um, I don't know if there's anything, no, there's no, no identifying tags on or anything like that. But it's a really nice mat here for having on the bench because um, it's soft. Uh, if you drop anything on it, um, you know, it doesn't go bouncing all over the place. It's pretty dead when it hits it, um, and I like that a lot. Uh, it also keeps things from sliding around on the surface here. The other thing that I did when it comes to reloading presses is I have my Dillon uh, 550B. So what I can do when I want to go into um, pistol reloading mode is pull this off the top shelf up here and go and mount it to, I got it on strong mounts and I can mount it. I've already got the bolts uh, drilled here uh, to the bench where I can mount the 550. My concern was is that you know, if I mount these things all up constantly, um, or they were permanently in place, that I, by the time I did this, I would only have a very small, you know, section of bench here left. So my idea was basically to drill it, and then when I do want to reload, um, I've got enough room here that I can reload. But basically, the, the SL900 stays here all the time because I'm reloading on it all the time. It seems, uh, in terms of pistol or rifle ammunition, this is kind of sporadic as I need it. Um, then I'll, I'll pull it down. Um, the other thing I have here also is my mech uh, size master, which you've seen before in the past. And if I can do that without creating a disaster here, I've got holes drilled for it here also that I can mount um, that temporarily and do reloading uh, small batch stuff there. Now, you might ask, well, what would I possibly be using that for when I've had the SL900? What I've actually done with this is that sometimes I've loaded up like some experimental loads or something like that where I didn't feel like converting or fully converting over the SL900 uh, to whatever I was playing with, um, where it was just faster for me to, to dial up. I have my universal charge bar in here right now so I can dial in the powder and dial in the shot and get it exactly for whatever I want to do. Um, when I was developing three quarter ounce loads, I actually started here, and then after I came up with something that I liked, I then just you know replicated it in the SL900. Um, but sometimes it's just you know faster to set something like that rather than having to go and reconvert the SL900 to do whatever I want to do. Uh, so that's one of the other nice features here of having lots of bench space, but also being able to just have drilled holes is that you can kind of you know pull things up, push things down um, as you go. Uh, in terms of the way I have things laid out, I, 
there is no really rhyme or reason to where I really have anything, and yet it's kind of funny I know where actually everything is. I have a lot of my manuals and stuff like that over here in the corner. Um, I have some, wow, there's some really old shot shell powder here, uh, Winchester's 473 and some green dot. Um, the other powders are down here. I've got parts from pistols, magazines, springs, bullets, crud like that over there. Um, reloading dies and stuff like that are kind of all in this area up here. This whole entire shelf here is all my pistol and rifle reloading dies. Um, miscellaneous stuff that I keep going to is right here in the middle. So when I'm doing uh, cleaning and stuff like that, it's all down the lower level here. I figured that all the stuff that I want to use all the, all the time is going to be right centrally located here. And then things that I don't use as often kind of start spreading out toward the fringes and stuff like that. So again, my reload or my cleaning stuff is here. Dyes are here. Primers are here. I've got tons of pistol primers, uh, rifle primers, shot shell primers are up here. Um, and then my scale and wads and powder, other powder and stuff like that will kind of start spreading out um, to the sides. But again, it's you know it's, it's close enough that I can grab it. It's quick. It's easy. Stuff like that. The top shelf is basically where I, I rarely go to. Again, hence the. The, the 550 and the size master live up here um, in my tumbler, stuff like that, or up here where I'm not really inclined to go to it very often. There's also a, a middle shelf here um, where I keep shot shells, primers, uh, stuff like that. So I actually, during my downtime when I wasn't able to shoot, I decided to reload as much ammunition as I possibly could for the whole entire year. So I've got flats and flats and flats of... of um, of shot shells loaded up. I've got primers here, um, more oh, more shells loaded up, um, wads, more wads, wrenches, I mean just you know basic tools, things like that. Uh, I have a, a hopper here of, um, of shot that I keep down the lower level. So all my my heavy stuff is all down on the floor because I don't know, I mean, while this shelf here is pretty darn strong, I don't want to put any really heavy weight on it, so um, probably the most weight I have on it is, is the loaded shot shells and primers right now, but in terms of all the heavy weight, like bags of shot and stuff like that, it's all down here on the floor, uh, bottom level, uh, where, you know, it's not going to break or bend anything or anything like that, so... So basically that's it, um, pretty standard layout. Uh, I really like the bench. I would highly recommend that if you're looking for a bench that you do look at these plans. Again, it, it doesn't take really a long time to put it together. It's pretty simple. Um, couldn't really tell you in terms of cost because wood varies a lot these days of, of what it is. Uh, um, but it's not too expensive. I mean, I'm guessing probably somewhere between two or $300 or so in terms of wood. Um, might be a little bit more than that now uh, with the higher prices and everything. Um, but this bench is actually uh, a, a very common bench. If you look around on the web, you'll find this bench and bench mentioned frequently for people who have them. Um, a lot of times people will go out and get like a, an old hardcore door or something like that, put a couple um, uh, like saw horses up, so to speak, or something like that, and, and make a bench out of it. But I, I like this in that it's a little more permanent. It's steady. Um, I've been under this thing when I had to move it into position because it's, it's very narrowly positioned here between my safe and the wall. So I actually had to crawl underneath this thing and pushing up on my hands and my knees of being able to lift it and move it like two or three inches. I can tell you it weighs a lot. Um, it's not going anywhere. So anyway, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and, and send us an email at powerfactorshow at gmail.com. Thanks. Hey, Power Factor fans, I'm Rick. Uh, we're going to have some more garage fun today with IDPA rules. We're kind of going through them methodically. Uh, we covered equipment rules, guns, then belts and holsters and mag pouches. Now we're going to get into the safety rules. Um, the safety rules haven't changed a lot, uh, but there are some things that are different. So if you've been shooting uh, the sport for a few years, uh, you'll notice some differences. I'm just going to go through them in the book. Uh, I'm going to skip the stuff that really hasn't changed. This is more just like a heads up for the people who have been playing the game and are, you know, things are going to change. It's been six months now that the new rules have been out, so it shouldn't be a surprise. But I just thought I'd go through them since we started down that road. Um, there are some new rules about uh, muzzles over the berm. That was something that was not in 
past versions of the rule book, it was kind of left up to local rules. If somebody led a round off over the berm, pointed the gun over the berm, uh, the IDPA rules didn't address that, and they do now. Um, if you send a round over the berm, that's a DQ. I think at most local, at the local level, most clubs have rules like that that were in place anyway, but now at least it's, it's universal across all the clubs. Um, uh, another place is, where, where we've got a new rule is if you point the muzzle over the berm during the pull the trigger portion of the unload and show clear command, as you're unloading and showing clear, if you don't keep that muzzle level or below level, if you let that muzzle get up over the berm when you pull the trigger, that's a DQ. Um, and now that, we also have some new, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself too much, but the pull the trigger range command is a new command and we'll get into that. But just be really uh, mindful, uh, as you should be anyway, that if you pull the trigger, even if the gun's empty, if you pull the trigger with a muzzle pointing over the berm, uh, that's a DQ. Uh, there's some other interesting things. Uh, another uh, new rule is establishing stage boundaries. And it's defined in the rule book. We'll get into that more in the uh, shooting rules uh, part of the rules evaluation. Um, but you now have a boundary established of when you're on the stage or off the stage. If you drop or cause to fall, a loaded gun or an unloaded gun within the stage boundaries, that's a DQ. If you drop the gun outside of the stage boundaries, IDPA considers that to be outside the match and that the local range conditions will prevail. So let's say you're in the parking lot and your gun falls out of the holster, that's not an automatic DQ according to IDPA rules. That refers then back to the local club rules. Um, Another new thing that we have, and this one I think is, I consider it very controversial. Um, I've been teaching the safety officer class. And we've got a lot of questions about it after shooting half a dozen matches under the new rule book. I, I'm still kind of not so sure about it. But uh, it used to be that the finger warning to a shooter whose finger appeared to be on the trigger or in the trigger guard was sort of like a, a, a cover warning. You, you could say it repeatedly. Um, there was no limit on how many times a shooter could be warned. Um, and, and as long as the shooter complied, uh, there was no penalty. Now, obviously, if it became a problem where, okay, I've warned this guy once on the first stage, once on the second stage, twice on the third stage, then it becomes a safety issue whether I think there's a ru specific rule that applies or not. But what we have now is, is essentially removing finger as a warning and introducing finger as a penalty. So in, in that sense, it's a little bit more like cover because if you have called cover on someone and they fire a shot out of cover, they get a penalty. Same thing with the finger warning now, not really a warning. If you get a finger call from the safety officer, the first time you will get a PE a three second penalty for getting a finger call from the safety officer. And the, and the rule is specifically, this is rule 2.6, if you wanna look it up, the trigger finger must be obviously and visibly outside the trigger guard during loading, unloading, drawing, holstering, while moving, unless engaging targets, or during malfunction clearance. The first offense is a procedural error penalty. That's three seconds. Second offense is a match DQ. So that's a really a huge difference. I mean, I've never seen, I think I've maybe warned somebody twice during a given match, new shooters generally, over the course of six or seven stages, I might have to remind them, mention it once and remind them once. Um, but now the first time is a three second penalty, the second time's a DQ. So that's a big difference. Um, you know, it's hard to question safety rules, you know, rules that have uh, safety as their primary focus, but it's a big change. And um, again, visibly and obviously outside the trigger guard, not just not on the trigger, but outside the trigger guard. I often tell people, if I can't see your fingernail, um, I might be concerned that your finger is on the trigger. Um, so obviously a finger call, uh, could come even if your finger is not on the trigger, if it's not visibly and obviously outside the trigger guard. So just be aware of that. 
Um, and then of course, because you could get the PE, the first call on the PE on the first stage, and a second call on the last stage, match administrators are required to record that PE in a way that it follows the shooter throughout the match. Uh, one of the problems that hasn't really come up yet at our club is we've instituted electronic scoring and the practice score uh, software that we're using does not have a place to enter uh, penalties that are supposed to then carry along. You know, there's a little place to put a PE on each stage, but there's no place to put a PE warning essentially that carries across from stage to stage. So you're, if, if you're administering a match, you're still gonna have to come up with some method. I was thinking like a scarlet letter maybe, um, you know, to apply to somebody who's gotten the PE so that you know if they get another one, they're done. But I think a lot of the times there's little attention paid to uh, on squads, you know, obviously, where the safety officers are traveling with the squad, they will be aware, you know, that, hey, Bob there got a PE on stage one, and now there's his second finger call on stage seven. He's done. But at a sanctioned match where each group of officials generally sees each shooter only once, you have to come up with some method of making sure that that PE follows the shooter from stage to stage, so that if they do get a second one, um, you know, that that shooter needs to be disqualified. Uh, another new rule is official adoption of the 180 as, as a muzzle safe point. I think most clubs throughout the country were using the 180 as a default muzzle safe point already. I know we always have uh, for, you know, we've been shooting now for 14 years. We've always used the 180 as a default. And then only if we wanted to narrow the direction of fire or expand the direction of fire would we ever use cones to delineate the specifics on a given stage for those expanded or contracted uh, muzzle safe points. But we generally just use the 180, and now uh, IDPA has essentially done the same thing. Uh, default now is the 180 in the absence of any indication of uh, another uh, muzzle safe direction. Uh, and of course they suggest cones or something readily identifiable to, to mark those uh, muzzle safe points. We've always used the orange traffic cones and that seems to be sort of universal, but you could also use a flag or just something so that everybody's aware. Uh, this one is kind of minor, I think. I'm just going through the rules here in order. Uh, this one popped up uh, about safe areas, very specific, what can and can't be done in the safe areas. One of the things that's new is reload practice within the safe area is not allowed. Um, I wasn't really sure, you know, why would that be? Was it, a, you know, they're afraid that live ammo would get in the gun, but apparently really what was driving it was uh, people standing at the safe area you know, essentially dominating the safe area while they practiced their reloads and people who needed to gun up couldn't get access to the table while people were practicing. So they just said, uh, no, no reloading practice in the safe area. Uh, now we're back to the range commands. Uh, they have, they're, they're effectively they haven't changed much, but I think when the initial rule books came out 10, 15 years ago, there was a definite uh, anti Ipsic kind of a theme to some of the rules. Like we're, we're not gonna do it this way because that's the way Ipsic does it. And the range commands were written in such a way that they were almost identical to Ipsic range commands, but they were just a little bit different. And for people who shoot both sports, you know, it's like, okay, is it are you ready or shooter ready kind of a thing. And so now finally, uh, IDPA has adopted essentially uh, the USPSA range commands. So you have, uh, the, now a new range command, well, I'm just gonna run, down, run them down in order. There is a new range command, uh, range is hot, eyes and ears. And that defines the beginning of the stage. Um, you have uh, the, the start of the course of fire. And so that includes the load and make ready and other commands within uh, the course of fire. And so uh, range is hot, eyes and ears is the first command. Load and make ready is the second command. Now that's actually an older USPSA command that's since been replaced by just make ready and we may see that change in the future too because uh, you obviously do have courses of fire where your gun's not loaded at the start. So load and make ready wouldn't be the right range command for a stage with an empty gun start. But uh, so load and make ready has, uh, has uh, replaced shooter ready. Um, or actually, are you ready has replaced shooter ready. So they've introduced, again, USPSA command, are you ready? Stand by, beep, bang, 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 bang. And then of course, during the course of fire, you have your 
warnings, finger, which we've already covered, is no longer really a warning. It's an announcement that you're going to get a penalty. Muzzle, um, again, if somebody's muzzle seems to be swaying to the point that it could get outside those muzzle safe points, you can give a muzzle warning. Uh, and then stop, which of course is the warning that you've got to stop. Um, it could be safety, it could be the shooter has done something to disqualify themselves and they're unaware of it, but it's one of those deals where when you pull that one out, uh, they need to immediately comply because you don't know if it's a safety issue or not. I remember I, I, I was watching a match, uh, not an IDPA match, where a shooter essentially was protesting. He, he knew he was gonna be disqualified and in protest, he continued to shoot after the stop came. And there's absolutely no room for that kind of thing. I mean, you stop and then we'll determine why you were stopped. I mean, another time we stopped a guy because there was a deer on top of the berm. I mean, the shooter doesn't know necessarily why they're being stopped. Um, so the stop command is just stop. Cover, classic, um, you know, it's the same deal. 50, no more than 50% of your upper body or less than 50% of your upper body can be exposed to the threat you're engaging. No part of the lower body may be exposed to the threat you're engaging. We're gonna do an entire episode on cover. The previous episode we did a couple of years ago is now out of date um, since the, the cover rules have changed and we'll get into that. But the cover warning uh, has changed a little bit in that if the shooter is, has essentially already earned the penalty, you're not supposed to call cover. Um, in, in other words, don't use it as an announcement that you're going to get a penalty, use it as a warning. Some shooters will actually ask that you not warn them. They'll, they'll be distracted by the cover warning, but in general, I will, if I think a shooter is about to trigger a shot when they're not behind cover, I'll yell cover, but after they've fired a shot, don't say a word, just give them the three second penalty. If finished, unload and show clear, pretty standard. And now again, adopting the USPSA IPSC range command, if clear, slide forward or cylinder closed in the case of a revolver. So instead of um, uh, confirming or telling the shooter that the, that the uh, chamber is clear, you're asking them to essentially uh, agree with you, if clear, if you think it's clear. Um, it essentially puts the burden on the shooter, I think is the point, um, but there you go, so if clear slide forward or cylinder closed, and then um, pull the trigger. Hammer down used to be the, um, the command, and even after 15 years, maybe some people were still, when you say hammer down, they were still decocking or riding the hammer down or something. I don't know how that could last more than one match, but anyway, um, that's the rule, old rule has been replaced uh, with pull the trigger. And that's put it, pointed at the berm, pull the trigger, and again, if the muzzle's elevated above the berm when you pull the trigger, that's match DQ. Um, holster, we know that one. And then again, in an adoption of uh, the USPSA range command, what was range is safe, which of course the range never is really safe, now the range is clear. So if you're familiar with the USPSA range commands, uh, these will all be very familiar. If you've never shot any USPSA, it'll be a change and you'll have to um, learn the new ones. And you must learn them. Um, I'm gonna be teaching my fourth uh, safety officer class this coming weekend. And the safety officer class instructions really harp on using the approved range commands. So don't say things like, you know, Line is ready on the left, line is ready on the right. I mean, I've heard some stuff from people who I think have backgrounds in you know, high power competition or whatever. They've got different commands that they're used to using, but learn the new range commands and use them. And we'll get into shooting rules uh, and, and you know, we're just gonna take it a step at a time. Uh, there's your uh, new IDPA safety rules. If you have any questions, uh, of course, you're always free to give us a, shoot us an email or find us on Facebook.